I'm Peter Bashar. I'm the general counsel of Marsh & McLennan. It's a Fortune 200 company, about 55,000 employees in 90 countries around the world, half insurance and half consulting. One of the wonderful aspects of the law is the many different avenues that you can follow uh, with a law degree. And so I've had the opportunity to work in government service. Uh, I worked for our former Secretary of State, uh, Cyrus Vance, on the Yugoslavian peace negotiations. And then I worked in a large uh, law firm, Gibson, Dunn & Crutcher, for a decade, uh, which was an extraordinary uh, company and an extraordinary experience. And then I came here to Marsh & McLennan. If your parents are passionate about something, it's not crazy, the idea that children sometimes uh, pursue a similar uh, path. Uh, it's an extraordinary path that particularly my mother uh, traveled down. I'm Christine Bichar and I am a lawyer at Cravath, Swain and Moore in New York City. Uh, my mother came to this country from Germany in the early 1950s on a scholarship and met my father uh, on a blind date and they ultimately got married. My father went off to practice as a young lawyer at Sullivan and Cromwell and my mother decided that she was going to try to share the interest that my father had. Uh, Bob was at the time a lawyer and was very passionate about the law and I got law 24-7 anyway and I looked around for a job and thought um, if I learned something about the law um, we would have the best chance to work together and be the, have the kind of partnership that I knew from my parents who had run a big farm in eastern Germany. So she started out working as a switchboard operator uh, in a very small law firm. I ran the switchboard and learned to play canasta for three weeks at $55 a week. Big deal. Then Davis Polk called back and uh, they then offered me a job as an assistant librarian and that I thought was terrific. When my husband got hired for a job to represent SNH green stamps. They, at the time, had legislation introduced against green stamps in 40 states of the country. And they needed somebody with Bob Smarts to go retain counsel in all those 40 states and start trying to defeat this legislation. And he said, I'll take the job if you hire my wife as my assistant. And so that led to us being hired two of us for 10,000 bucks a year and if they had asked us to sign on the dotted line we would do that for the rest of our lives we probably would have. So they worked together for four years and in those days in the 1950s uh, it was possible to read for the law uh, similar to what Abraham Lincoln had done and take the bar exam without having gone to law school. And so um, we filed the papers and I became a clerk. We had three daughters, three daughters in three years. If you had filed as a clerk, you were allowed four weeks vacation, that was it. So I took one week with the first daughter and two weeks with the second one and three with the third. Bob was a pretty strict taskmaster. He just, you know, one book after the other. I can remember sitting there reading Prosser on Torts and uh, Corbin on contract while I was nursing. Then took the bar exam and I had no idea how I would do. And at the first lunch I felt terrific because I didn't know whether I had the right answer but I knew the questions didn't baffle me particularly. And I went out and bought myself a hat. After working with my father for four years she took the bar exam and became the first woman in the history of the great state of New York uh, to pass the bar exam without having gone to law school. Casey Lane didn't quite know what to do with me at the time because now they had to pay me as a lawyer rather than as a clerk. And so they said, how about trust in the states? And I said, that was fine, anything was fine. I just wanted to work with Bob and, and be a partner to him and whether we were going to do that at a, at a firm that just seemed really to be not in the cards, certainly at, at Casey Lane. And she was hired by Cravath, Swain and Moore, then a very prominent Wall Street law firm uh, in the early 1960s. When Ariel Kogan, who was at Cravath, who had been a lifelong friend, 
her husband and my husband started out at S&C together. Um, and she and I had lunch and she said, we have kind of trouble getting good people into trust and estates because Cravath is known for corporate work and litigation, but not for trust and estates. And I said, hell, <laughs> give me a try. And um, I went over and was hired that afternoon. And then in 1970, uh, she was made the first woman partner uh, at really a major Wall Street law firm. Gilpatrick was the presiding partner of Cravath at the time. And he had been the Secretary of the Navy. Very impressive fellow. One morning I was told by the receptionist as I came, um, Gilpatrick wants to see you. And he'd never asked to see me. I'd never worked with him. I knew he was the presiding partner. I knew I was in trouble. <laughs> and so I went to his office and he sat me down across from his desk and said, um, from voted last night that uh, you would be a partner. And it was a tremendous surprise to me. And so I walked around the desk to give him a hug. And then there was the paper basket in between us, which was probably just as well, but anyway. <laughs> I gave him a hug, he was very surprised. And I sat back down and he said, um, there is one problem that we haven't quite been able to cope with. And I said, oh, nuts. Here it comes, the second, uh, second level partnership. And he said, there's a partner's bathroom. <laughs> and I said, as a matter of fact, why is there? <laughs> if you want to have partnership at the office, you have to have partnership at home. And the idea that you can have it all and do it all is just ridiculous. There is the family, there is the profession, and then there is everything else. And you surely shortchange everything else. But those two, I don't think I've shortchanged. I think she was very aware that as a professional woman, there were times when your childcare um, didn't work out. Somebody calls in and all of a sudden you're trying to figure out what to do if you do have an important meeting. The girls went to Brick Nursery School and I would take them over on the bus and drop them off and uh, the babysitter would take care of Peter. And one day she didn't show up and I couldn't get hold of her and didn't know what was up. Anyway, Elena was not there. So I took Peter along with me and the girls expecting to drop him off at nursery school too, asking them to keep him for a morning while I had my meeting at the office. And I got there and uh, Betsy Karabak, bless her soul, said, can't do that. And so I stood on Park Avenue <laughs> with Peter in tow and didn't know what the hell to do. What do you do? You've got to go to the office. And in those days, bringing the office, the kid to the office was totally impossible and so that story and that feeling I can feel it in my gut still what do you do when profession and family clashes it doesn't often but when it does and led me then when we moved into this building to say haha that empty second floor I know what I'm gonna do with that but how to persuade, I was the only woman partner, how to persuade, at that time, 65 partners, I think, to put in a children's center, they said. We are not in the business of running a nursery school, et cetera, et cetera. And Sam Butler, presiding partner, said, okay, well, you know, you have to defend it. And I said, oh, you're gonna defend it. And he did. He brought it up at the partners meeting and he said this is what the plan is. Here are the rules under which we think we can run this and we'll give it a try. And there was only, because he was, uh, I mean the gold standard, Sam Butler is a terrific lawyer and was a wonderful presiding partner and only one of the partners objected. And we all know who it was and he's regretted it since. <laughs> 
it was for free from the beginning that any employee, there was also the question whether just the lawyers or everybody, and I said, I'm not going to do it unless it's for everybody. And so that everybody can bring their kid, um, if there's an emergency at home to begin with, and now it is just for any reason that you would like to bring the kid in for a day or for a couple of hours uh, to the office. And uh, the usage is terrific. You know, when you grow up in a family, you typically think that that's the norm. Whatever it is that is the, the spirit and the ethos in the family, the incredible primacy of the family, we thought that was the norm for everybody. The fact that uh, people would go out into the workplace and pursue and try to make a difference, that that was considered the norm. So it's really probably only much later that people realized of just how, uh, how strange we are. Family dinner was sacrosanct. You had to come together at the end of the day and really tell your stories, learn how to articulate uh, some thoughts and some expressions. Uh, the dynamic in the living space was pretty close. Uh, there were four kids in the family and my three sisters and I shared one bedroom together with my three sisters in a triple-decker army bed, right, right top to bottom. So it was close living. Each of the kids had made dinner one night. I can't remember what your specialty was, Peter. Wiener schnitzel. Oh, um, okay. Mm -hmm. Good, very good Wiener schnitzel. People talked in the family. It wasn't All necessarily so much about the law. It was about what had happened in your life and current events, current events. You know, urge to read the newspaper and talk about uh, what was going on in the world. My mother has this uh, devotion to the family, but also this fairly extraordinary work ethic. And at the, well, I shouldn't say her age, let's just say she's in her 80s, past the point at which a number of people might retire from a prominent Wall Street law firm. And my mother says in the family that she would pay cravat rather than the other way around to have the opportunity to continue to come into the office. Oh, but Bob won't let me do that. Ah, there you go. <laughs> Okay. And once again, I'm the only girl on the floor. <laughs> 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 Except for Kathleen.